Welcome to Conversations, a podcast provided by the Center for Thriving Leaders and sponsored by Grace Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Trent Lambert, and we are here to help leaders thrive in ministry. Let's jump into the conversation for today. Welcome to Conversations, a podcast provided by the Center for Thriving Leaders, sponsored by Grace Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Trent Lambert, and we are here to help leaders thrive in ministry. So let's jump right into the conversation for today. And I want to welcome Dr. White to our program. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Dr. White is the founding and senior pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mech began with a single family and has grown to more than 20,000 active attenders through our in-person and online campuses. Mech also experiences more than 70, 70 percent of its growth. Wow, 70 percent of its growth from those who are previously unchurched. That's phenomenal, Pastor. Dr. White is the president of Serious Times, a ministry that explores the intersection of faith and culture and hosts churchandculture.org featuring his blog, a weekly podcast, and a wide range of resources to serve the church and former professor of theology and culture at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where he also served as their fourth president and author of more than 20 books that have been translated into 10 languages among Dr. White's many books are The Gold Medallion, Nominous Serious Times, and A Search for the Spiritual. His most recent releases are Christianity for People Who Aren't Christians, Uncommon Answers to Common Questions, its companion titled after I Believe, Everyday Practices for a Vibrant Faith, and his latest book is Hybrid Church, Rethinking the Church for a Post-Christian Digital Age. Once again, sir, thank you for joining the Grace College Seminary Podcast. Trent, thank you for having me. Um, James, we, we have here at Grace College of Seminary, we um, have new leadership over the past five years with a new dean, Dr. Freddie Cardoza. And Dr. Freddie Cardoza has just been forward thinking. He's been innovative and accepting of some different ideas. Well, I shouldn't say different, just new ideas. And so we here at Grace really... Um, kind of pride ourselves on trying to be innovative ahead of culture that we can truly minister as many people as we possibly can. And so in all that, we discovered your book, Hybrid Church, which I hope listeners, you need to get the book, find the book. Later on, I'll ask Dr. White how we can purchase and find that book. But um, I've been so enamored by it as we're developing some new programs here. We're going to talk about that in today's program. So before we get going, why don't you tell us a little about yourself, where you're from, and your family makeup? Well, I'm from Chicago and raised out west in Los Angeles and then Seattle and sometime in Utah as well. Uh, but my family on both sides were North Carolinians for generations until they moved back here when I was in high school. And uh, and then um, and my wife when I was in college in Carolina. Uh, and then um, we... Um, I became a Christian when I was in my 20s, largely through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, mm -hmm. later on in college, and I met my wife through that too. Married, we have four kids, and now 15 grandchildren, and so that keeps us busy. So Christmases are pretty large for you. <laughs> they are. What a, what a blessing for sure. Uh, so you've kind of been all over the country. I have. What was it? So was it? Was it family that kind of brought you back to North Carolina? Yeah, we moved back here. My uh, when I was sixteen, and then so I finished high school here. But it was a bit of a culture shock since I've been raised out west, Midwest, my whole life. But uh, yeah, that's when they came back. Now you are a former professor and also president of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Tell us a little bit about your academic journey and connection, and and then after that, kind of your transition then into the pastoral world. Yeah, I think like you, Trent, I've kind of had my feet in two camps most of life, both in uh, vocational Christian ministry with the local church as well as academia. Um, after I did my MDiv, I went on did my PhD, and I did that in systematic theology and other areas of church history and biblical studies. 
uh, kind of focus on all three of those areas. Went on to Vanderbilt, did advanced religious work, uh, advanced university study there, did postdoctoral work at Oxford, and just felt like that was what God was wanting me to do, was to pursue academia. And uh, But when I was finishing up my PhD during that time, I was um, had an opportunity to pastor a local church. Um, and I'll be really honest, at that time, I knew, I knew if I wanted to, to teach in a seminary and if I wanted to be a part of maybe a Bible college or something, they often wanted to be some type of pastoral. Mm-hmm. And so I said yes, and I was introduced to the most dysfunctional church in the history of Christendom, I think. I was like the sixth pastor they'd had in eight years. They were filled with division and discord, and it was just an absolute mess. And I remember I would lay awake at night and after a brutal day of trying to serve in that context and just say, gosh, wouldn't church be great if, you know, if we could just be freed up to do this. Mm-hmm. And I would just let my mind fast. And during that time also, I had a rekindling and a renewal of my own sense of the depth and power of the doctrine of ecclesiology, which, as you know, is not exactly in the forefront of many American evangelicals. It's probably our weakest doctrine. Mm-hmm. And yet I had that real robust sense of renewal with that and a sense of the centrality of the church and that it was the hope of the world that it was part of the mission and what Jesus wanted to do in this world he wanted to do it through the local church and I just fell in love with the idea of the church and so um really redirected my life and and ended up planting a church and um and but continued it in academia as well and was an adjunct professor for many, many years and a visiting professor for many years at various places. And then there was a season where Gordon Conwell, where I had been an adjunct for 10 years, asked if I would become their next president. I agreed to that for a season and then uh, and continued my involvement uh, serving Mac and um, and then handed it over to Hatton Robinson mm-hmm. and continued on with Mac. And so that was, uh, um, yeah. And, and so your church, uh, you, the nickname is Mech. Yeah, Mecklenburg Community Church is the full name. Mecklenburg mm-hmm. County is where we're at, where Charlotte, North Carolina is, and we just call it Mech for short. So you're the founding pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church. Um, I'm a church planter as well. I've started three churches. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the story and the founding? You've, you've shared a little bit there, but the, kind of the story and the founding of Mecklenburg Community Church. Yeah. Started in the fall of 1992, I'm Charlotte. I mean, no people, no money, no hiving off from another church, no building. Literally, we showed up in a U-Haul, and um, and we had been invited and had been exploring church planning, been invited by local churches. We felt strongly about we wanted to go to a place where we were sent and invited. The north side of Charlotte at that point in time was virtually non-existent. Now, obviously, Charlotte, uh, quite quite the church growth, um, quite the the city growth story. But where we went, there were no new churches, really, and um, and nobody really wanted to go. It wasn't like the hot church plant place to go. But we went and felt deeply called about it and started in a Hilton Hotel. <laughs> That's the only place to meet. And, uh, I re- and we had 112 people at our first service, and through the strength of my preaching, we were at 56 by the third week. <laughs> so cut that one in half. Yeah. And so we began very modestly. And, uh... <laughs> And began to grow from there and uh, built it family by family, year after year. And uh, and now, um, yeah, and, and, it, and God's been really good. And now it's, a, you know, we've, as is, we mentioned, that 75, uh, 70% of our total growth has consistently come from the unchurched. And um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been a, remarkable, a remarkable ride in terms of just the growth. So your first service, you had a little over 100 people. And then what are you running on average today? Can I ask that? Yeah, um, we uh, were running uh, at the end of last year, we uh, Christmas services and stuff, we were running over 20,000. We just had over 43,000 this year, a uh, combination of in-person and online. And um, so it's been actually remarkable. Absolutely. And the reason I ask that is... Um, could you give, because we, we, we've got some church pastors, we've got some ministry leaders, but we also have some church planters that are listening to us. And this is just maybe a little bit off off our topic, but are there a couple pointers that you could give some modern-day church planters to encourage them today? 
Well, I would say that, you know, I, I, you know, we never had the kind of, you hear these stories, you know, Outreach Magazine, 100 Fastest Growing Churches mm-hmm. and such. Outreach is a great thing, and, I, and those lists are fun to look at. We don't even submit our numbers to it, not because we're mad at them or anything. We just didn't want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. We just don't. We just don't. Life Church and others don't. Just It's just one of those things. It's just a personal thing for us. Um, but we... Um, we we never had this remarkable like oh we grew by three thousand this year and you hear all these doors hey I'm not always sure that that's healthy right. I mean yay God you want to say but I'm not sure it's always healthy ours was more acorn to oak again I've been I pastored I started this in 1992 I've been at it for 32 years and so yes now we're a church that is quite large but we started very very small and it was just like year after year after year after year I remember. Early on, I was talking with a seasoned pastor of one of the largest churches at that time in Charlotte. And he just said, you know, Jim, we just have never had just like massive breakout growth. It's been kind of our average attendance has kind of increased by 100 or so every year. But it's been year after year after year. And, you know, when you hang in there, all of a sudden you started with 100. And now all of a sudden you're at three or 4,000. And, and, you know, that's just that hanging in there, acorn to oak, mm-hmm. being faithful. And so that would be the main thing that I would say to people. Let's transition from there. And um, I, I love listening to church planters. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a church planter myself and just hearing those stories. And and James, as you know, not all of them are like that. Um, so, so some some don't receive or, or attain that kind of growth. And unfortunately, some of them actually close. So um, there, there's some good, the bad, and the ugly there. Church planting isn't easy, for sure. Um, so let, let's transition just a little bit. And the, one of the things that's fascinating to me t- for today's conversation is digital church. And I, I saw a comment that you made um, that the church 1.0 and 2.0 won't cut this environment anymore. We need church 3.0. What would you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think this is this is a, a very significant cultural conversation, and one that I believe in. Uh, believe we need to be talking about more, and, and this is discussed in, in the book Hybrid Church. And here's the thesis: Church 1.0. I mean, let me back up. Thesis is based on this. There's two dynamics to missiology, two dynamics to the mission of the church. One is the mission field itself, the nature of the mission field, and second, how do you communicate that mm-hmm. mission field? So. If you go back to the early church, church, what I would call church 1.0, um, the mission field was pre-Christian, you know, uh, Jews, Judaizing Gentiles, pagans, but it was pre-Christian. And the way of communicating to that mission field was largely oral in nature. So even if they, for example, one of the letters from the apostle Paul was, you know, arrived in Corinth, it was read orally to the assembled church. It was an oral communication culture. And the church that arose to meet that challenge of a pre-Christian mission field and an oral form of communication, I call church 1.0. Okay. Well, then you fast forward to, and you can say that this was uh, the conversion of Constance, we can point to other historical figures, but there was a transition from pre-Christian in the West to a Christian world. And alongside of that, almost simultaneously, was a transition from oral written oral communication to written communication. And so you had simultaneously a changing of the mission field from pre-Christian to Christian and a changing of how you communicate to that mission field from oral to written. And the church that arose and embraced that mythologically for that day, I call church 2.0. That was the iteration. Now fast forward again. And again, there's a lot of history that's being covered here. But when you're talking about just the mission field and the way to communicate to that mission field, there really have only been three eras. The third era was when you went from pre-Christian to Christian to post-Christian, which is our world today, Mm -hmm. and from communicating that field orally to written to digital. And so this is only the third major revolution, the third type of mission field we've faced since the beginning of the church, and only the third way of communicating that mission field we've dealt with since the church began. And the church that has to arise to meet that challenge and embrace it called Church 3.0. Could you define for us, for our listeners, what is meant by digital church? 
Well, I don't know that I like that name. Um, I, I think I, I like, that's why I, I, I like the word hybrid. Hybrid. Because hybrid is this idea of both digital and physical, both embodied and, you know, online. And, and I think that it's not an either or, it's a both and. I, I really don't embrace a fully digital model of church. I, I think there are aspects that, that are best embodied or that there's a, 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 a kind of a, a synthesis that, that happens and, and a catalytic nature to the digital and the physical coming together. And so hybrid is where it's not an either or, it's a both and, both digital and physical. And so I think that that is what is called for in our day and what is so absolutely essential because it is, there has been a digital revolution. There's no way to, there's no way to deny that. We do, the nature of communication has changed to a digital form of communication and it is a post-Christian world. And so a hybrid model that embraces both the physical and the digital is essential. I think what you just said, I mean, we, we could close everything off right now and said we had church. What you just said, I think our listeners need to hear is that we're not promoting one or the other. It's a both and. I, I think that's essential. Um, we have come out of a period of time in our culture, a historical spot where we call it the pandemic, COVID. Um, in your opinion, what has COVID done to ministry strategies for the church today? Uh, two things. One, I think that COVID revealed how outdated many of those strategies were. Mm. In other words, we had, we were all pre-COVID. See, that's one of the things that I, I really want. I'm so glad you raised this question. COVID did not create the need for a hybrid church. COVID did not create a digital revolution. COVID Amen. did not Amen. create a post christian world. All of those things existed prior to COVID. What COVID did was accelerate these cultural forces and streams that were already in place. And second, it revealed that the church was kind of the how close. And it was revealed that the church really had, had been kind of uh, surviving, uh, you know, based on an old model, but then COVID came and just stripped it bare. Mm -hmm. And that just hastened, you know, so many different things. But, it, but what COVID did was it simply accelerated what was already taking place. It just accelerated the post-Christian de-churching, post-Christian world and the de-churching that was going on, and it accelerated the nature of the digital revolution and how much that had taken hold of society. And then it revealed to the church, I think, just how um, how we were kind of like a deer in the headlights with it. What would you say to a pastor today? Maybe we've got a pastor listening today who's maybe in this situation, and they're saying, you know what, we, we are you know post-COVID now, we're, we're trying to get back to normalcy, which I'm not sure if we'll have what we think normalcy is, but we're trying to get back to that, and we're contemplating, okay, getting people back in the pew. Should we shut off live streaming? Should we shut off those digital pieces to try to get people back into church? What would you say to a pastor who's wrestling with that right now? Well, I would say absolutely do not do that. If, I mean, that would just be going back to the way you were doing ministry prior to this acceleration and denying the fact that there has been a digital revolution. What you need to do is to embrace a hybrid model. Just realize this is the new normal. This is how you're going to reach people. The front door of the church is no longer a weekend service. The front door of the church is your website or an online campus or an online service. That's where they're going to check you out. That's where if, you know, that's where, um, if, that pe your people are going to intuitively invite their unchurched friends. If you don't have that hook in the water, if you're not, you know, you, then you're only going to be oriented toward at best reaching the traditional already convinced. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to reach the unchurched and you're certainly not going to reach the, the post-Christian non-Christian. Um, and you're, it's going to be very, and, and, and obviously you're just going to continue to age as a, as a church body. And, con and the, you're, you're not going to regain your pre-COVID numbers. You're just going to continue to decline. And I don't say that with any joy. I don't say that in a condescending way. I'm just saying this is a reality. This has happened. And um, in fact, the first part of Hybrid Church, I talk about how there were four or five things that we did that were just brilliant, spot on, that most churches did to respond. But then when COVID went away, we immediately went back and stopped doing them. 
But yet those, you know, those things that we, we started to do were the hope of the church mm-hmm. and what we should have been doing long before COVID. And so I would say to any pastor, um, well, the first thing I would say is, you know, look, I know this can all be overwhelming. I know this can be intimidating. I know this can be like, oh my gosh, I didn't learn this in seminary. I don't feel like I've got the bandwidth to learn this now. I'm too old. I don't want to do this. And I would just say, look, I'm 62. I've got 15 grandchildren. I'm no digital native. And I'm having more fun Mm -hmm. and ministry now than ever. The church I lead is growing faster than ever. And, you know, it's, it's not that hard hard to embrace. That's why I wrote the book to kind of make things accessible and understandable. And, and really the kinds of things that you can do are not, you know, over anybody's, um, ahead. And so I just, I just hope that we'll seize this moment because it is a great moment to be a leading a church and trying to reach people. We think it's not, it's great. It is wide open. You know, James, you just hit on something that, um, Sometimes we think of technology and those kind of pieces as a young man's game. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I, you know, I, I've studied, um, baby boomers and, um, um, you know, I'll use my parents as an example. My parents, um, have fully embraced the hybrid model of church and their local church. Um, it's a very large church and, um, sometimes they are more tech savvy than I am. And so, um, I think that's a, what you just said. Church has become fun. It's engaging. It's, 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 it's relevant. It's creative. And, and I'm like you, um, church ministry for me again is fun again. And so that, what a, what a great yeah. word, um, what you just mentioned there. I hope our listeners grasp that. In your new book, Hybrid Church, we're talking about that. You said only a hybrid church can meet the missional and ministry needs of today. You kind of hit on that a little bit. Could you unpack it just a little bit more? Yeah, uh, and the re- and it goes back to the fact that we, um, again, we are having a new mission field with post-Christian and a new way of communicating to it, which is digital. Now, I, I believe that any, um, you know, good ecclesiology, any good doctrine of the church, is, and anyone's going to realize, hey, there's, there's some... There's some embodied elements to that. It can't, you know, online entirely may not be best. And there are some things that, you know, um, are critical for that. But you, you know, hybrid, that's the beauty of it. It's, it's both and. It's not an either or. Mm-hmm. And also just to understand that, that the digital is what's going to get them into the physical. It, it's reaching people online. It's going to get them into embodied experiences. And so it's just realizing that this is a, a, a new strategy, a church growth tool, a way of reaching people. Um, everybody you want to reach is online. That's where you're going to reach them. Mm-hmm. And just like in the 19, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know, I could say that the anointed ways of reaching people were buzzing and Sunday school and visitation and, you know, and revival. Well, in our day, it, it, it changed because of different forms of communication and a different starting point, a different culture. And so uh, a hybrid approach, I do believe, I do believe that is the way to reach people. It's the missional mandate of our day. There's all kinds of ways to be hybrid. And so I'm not trying to get into particulars there, but the idea of embracing the digital and the physical to me is just, just absolutely essential. James, I think one of the things that's, that's really important. Um, I remember years ago when I started pastoring, and um, we began to think about, okay, those that are nursing homes or certainly can't be in our building, we're going to do some type of a, you know, delivery system for those people. I remember when the internet first came out and, you know, some of the talks of live streaming and doing some things like that. As a pastor at that point, I, I'm just going to be honest and transparent, James. I was one of those, no way. You, you have to have yourself in the building I mean, this is going to hurt attendance. It's going to hurt tithing. No way. And then, um, you know, it didn't go away. Um, you, you tried to kind of push it under the rug a little bit. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit. It forced us to rethink some things. But but uh, even, even some churches that have embraced 
the live stream and so forth, James, you still kind of hear this in the advertisement that if you can't be here, you know, it's kind of like the second class or level B church is the other option. And, you know, when I, when I, I me too, when, when I, when I called you today and I got your church voicemail, I didn't hear that. What I heard was, here's a lot of different great options for you. You choose. And I think when we talk about hybrid church, it's not a class of, you know, here's here's A, the best. Here's B, the second best. And I think we have to be careful how we word this and advertise it to people. Totally agree. And 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 let's go ahead and, and, and address something, you know, that, that may be in lurking people's minds, all things hybrid. And as you say, you know, gathering online, being second class, people will often bring out that verse, you know, let us not stop meeting together and say, see, we're not supposed to stop meeting together. You, you are commanded to gather for corporate worship. And, and I deal with that passage in one of the sections of the book, because I say, well, let's go ahead and deal with the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. A, that passage, if you read it, the context of it, it has nothing to do with corporate worship, mm-hmm. absolutely nothing. The, the nature of reading that both in the words that's used in the Greek and everything else, it has to do with personal encouragement of each other. In other words, it's more about, I need to be an encourager to you and I need to not give up on us, you know, having, being iron on iron to each other. I need to make sure that that is what is not stopping. It has nothing to do right. with the life of the church in terms of corporate worship. So true. In fact, it's been called by many biblical scholars as one of the great urban legends that it has to do with you. You have to gather for worship publicly and also, I mean, not publicly, but um, in, in a physical way. What, what, what we need to get after is, is that there's a lot of ways to encourage one another, a lot of way to flush out, a lot of ways to flush out one another, and a lot of ways to gather. We're still used to having gathering be physical in a building at 11 o'clock on Sundays that we feel like that is now sacrosanct and somehow biblical, and you cannot get away from that. That's mm-hmm. definitely not true. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can gather, you can connect, you can have relationships, you can practice to one another in a lot of different ways. And, and so what we have is we have two campuses, uh, and we say we have the physical campus and we have our online campus. We don't care which one you attend. Mm. Uh, they're both there for you. And our online campus is robust and staffed with set service times and, you know, chat rooms and greeters and pastors and, 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 and it's just a, it's a rich community. And we, uh, and, and it's just if you cut yourself off from that, you're cutting yourself off from the way to reach the vast majority of people in our world. And even if you believe that it is best to gather in person for worship, okay, I'm not going to argue that with you. Mm-hmm. I don't agree, but I'm not going to argue. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think you can have, I think there's equal value in, in lots of ways of gathering. But let's just say that is what you think. That's fine. How are you going to get them there? How are you going to get an unchurched person there? You're going to have to at least start digitally, start online. You're going to reach them there first. They're going to check you out first. They're going to go online and check out your website first. The only people that are going to come to your church for the first time in person are the already convinced. Very few unchurched people will make that jump. They'll always check you out online first. James, if our listeners haven't listened to any of us, I hope they just listen to your last 30 seconds. Um, you unpacked that so well and gave some great direction and insight on that full of truth. Thank you. Thank you for unpacking that. Um, there is a term, and, and it was used in your book, and it's been used around with cultural studies and church studies, and it's the church, the word nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Could you unpack that word for us? Yeah, I actually wrote a book called The Rise of the Nuns, and, and it was uh, when, when that uh, phenomenon began. And quite frankly, it, it, it's, a, it's a simple idea, which was that an increasing number of people, when asked, what is your religion, you know, Baptist, Presbyterian, Christian, whatever, they would check the box, nothing. You know, I'm nothing, or I'm none, none of the above. And that's how that phrase, rise of the nuns, began. And risen consistently until now. It, it, when I first when I wrote that book, they were the fastest growing religious category and the second largest 
religious category in the United States. Now they are still the fastest growing, and now they are the largest religious category in the United States. The nuns are the number one um, category. And so these are people who are not necessarily close to God. Wait a minute. Like, would, you, would you say that again for our listeners? Yeah. Yeah, they're not close to God, but they're close to... Uh, uh, they're close to dogma. Yeah. They're close to denomination. They're close to... Maybe they would say, I'm not part of any particular church or movement. Um, you know, the classic spiritual but not religious would be they would many of them would accept themselves. Oh, I would although I would say that increasingly the most recent analysis is that they're becoming less spiritual as well as less religious, but they are very open to the occult. And that's a new hmm. phenomenon, which is another conversation. But um but yeah, they they would say, I'm nothing. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not anything. I don't want to be labeled. And I and they would find a label like a box. But they don't want to put themselves in. They want to be open to everything as well as nothing. With that understanding, now let's let's go to step two. I'm a practitioner. With that in mind, how should the church think about this new community? Well, we need to start where they are, and if you start where they are, like I said, you're going to start online. That's where you're going to reach them. That's where you're going to make connection points. But you also need to understand that when you begin to have an opportunity to engage and interact, you're going to have to begin with explanation. Uh, go all the way back. I've often said that you've got two models of, of evangelism in the New Testament, large group evangelism. You have Peter in front of the God-fearing Jews in Acts 2, and you have Paul in front of the, uh, at, at, at Mars Hill in Acts 17. And we've built our life around an Acts 2 model because we've lived in a Christian world. He was speaking to God-fearing Jews who believed in monotheism and the authority and inspiration of the Old Testament and that there was a Messiah going to be coming, and on and on it went. P, uh, Paul had none of that in Acts 17. Mm -hmm. And so, but we're used to speaking to God-fearing Jews. But no, we're actually on Mars Hill, Acts 17, a uh, post-Christian world. And if you recall, Paul didn't even begin with Jesus. He went all the way back to creation worked his way forward, laying the foundation where they could even begin to understand and appropriate the gospel. That kind of explanation tied, high, uh, you tied in with the fact that evangelism is not just event, but process and event, moving people down the line, is what's going to be key. I, I want to just kind of vastly just a little bit, because what you were you're sharing there kind of sparked some interest. So, so on a on a given Sunday, what what are some ideas, topics? What, what's your preaching like to your congregation? Deeply biblical and deeply, and, and you know, and and without any watering it down. I, I think that a lot of people feel like if you're going to talk to the unchurched, you're you know abandoning orthodoxy in order to get warm bodies, but you're not. You're being culturally relevant while remaining doctrinally pure, mm -hmm. and you're serving Scripture up stiff. Because if you don't, you don't have anything to offer the world that it doesn't already have. So true. So it's not like you're, you're, yeah, you're not telling them what they want to hear. You're telling them what they need to hear. But you're doing it in a hopefully winsome and compelling way. I've talked about it in terms of using both the prophetic and the evangelistic voice simultaneously. If you have the prophetic without the evangelistic, it just comes across as strident judgmentalism. So true. If you, if you use evangelism without the prophetic, particularly, you know, just kind of grace without the truth, well, often that can be licentiousness. And so what you, you need both. It's grace and truth, which is what Jesus came bearing. It's prophetic plus the evangelistic. And so, you know, we our, our, when I talk to our weekend crowd, I'm assuming, obviously, there's a lot of non-Christians there, and they're all part. And I, so I don't, I don't, and I don't assume that they're all Christians, and I address them as such, and I explain things. I would never say, you know, turn to John three fourteen. I would say, you know, well, you know, and there's a biography of Jesus in the New Testament named after the author, John, and he writes that, mm -hmm. you know, in half the scripture. So it's just the most simple of explanations on everything because you have to assume spiritual illiteracy. And then you're, you're explaining not just the Bible, but a theological backdrop at the same time. And so, um, it, it really is going back, if you think of a line from 1 to 10, a scale from 1 to 10, and let's say an 8 on that scale um, is when somebody is ready to really respond to the gospel, they understand the gospel, they've got enough knowledge to be responsible in that response. But most people today are sitting on a 2 or 3. 
And so what's missing is the process of moving people down the line from a two to a four to a six to an eight, where they would even be able to responsibly uh, engage the gospel. And so it's that sense of evangelism is both process and event. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to transition here as we um, here in a few moments come up to a close to our podcast together. Um, James, this has been so rich today, so helpful, and I really hope our listeners um, will take advantage of some of the insights that you're offering. Um, I certainly work at Grace College and Seminary, um, work with a lot of pastors. I'm in the classroom of students, oversee some master's programs. And so now this gets closer to my heart. Um, What can colleges and seminaries do better? to train future leaders in this concept of hybrid churches? Well, expose students to it. Whether it's my book or somebody else's books or writings, we expose people to new models of ministry in light of our post-Christian digital world. A second thing is is that, and I think Grace does a good job with this, but the seminaries need to work the churches and work the church leader Mm -hmm. so they don't get kind of separated from what's actually happening, you know, in the field. And to, to realize just that the practice of ministry has changed. It's just take new skills and, 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 and to really delve into this and not be threatened by it. And I really do believe, and I say this as a professor, as a former president of a seminary, that many times seminaries can get awkward feeling like, okay, I want to protect church history and theology and languages and so and true. really robust academic engagement at the same, and yet they feel like if I embrace and look at the practice of ministry and hybrid models and technology and, and evangelism and outreach and church growth, that somehow I'm taking away from these robust academic principles. And to me, that falls into the trap that churches can fall into, that somehow if I emphasize evangelism, I'm taking away from discipleship. And that's simply not true. It is both and not an either or. And if we can't pull off both, in the local church and in salvation, then Jesus is a liar because he said in the Great Commission, go and make disciples, not find them, woo them, make them and teach them everything. Mm -hmm. It's a discipleship and evangelism. They are not at odds with each other. They are in concert with each other. And so seminaries and colleges can have, you know, Aquinas and Bart and Bruner and Luther and Calvin and and, and, you know, um, all the greats in one hand and the newspaper in the other. As you're talking, I'm waving my hanky. I love it. <laughs> um, here at Grace College and Seminary, um, we do have a master's of, of arts and ministry studies in technology. And we teach some of these things and some of these ideas. And we're actually um, putting together some doctorate programs, and one concentration will be in digital or virtual church talking about these topics of hybrid church. So these are certainly areas, and I think what you just said is there are some new skills needed. You know, um, I know as a pastor, um, when I I had some people that were the the gamers, right, Um, they have some great skills, and they want to be used in ministry too. And so... um, uh, what a what a great opportunity we have to put some talents and abilities to use in our local churches. In our last moments together, James, what would you say to ministry leaders today about the topic of hybrid and digital church? If you got one last thing to encourage these pastors, um, what would you say to them? I would say that this is going to be the key to your future, mm. the key to your future growth, your future vibrancy, and don't fight it embrace it this is the new normal as i said we've 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 doubled over the last year and that's just incredible and and I, we would everyone here would say it's because of the hybrid model and it's things that we've done i mean for 30 some odd years this, the the major values don't change you know uh lost people matter to god and the bible is true and 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 such and you know children matter and and the arts and all of these kinds of things but the hybrid approach, embracing the physical and the digital. This is the big breakthrough. This is 
what it's going to revolutionize the church or have it um, languish if they reject it. So I would just say, open your heart, open your mind, um, strap on the learning curve. If hybrid church as a book helps, then yay, God, I wrote it for those who are just know nothing about any of it. And, um, and hopefully it will be an encouragement to people because any church can do this. There's not big price tags attached to it, not big staffing attached to it. Anybody can do this. Pastor White, you have several books, including the one that we've made mention to, Hybrid Church. How can people purchase those books, and how can they get a hold of you if they will have more information? Yeah, all the books, I mean, probably the easiest for everybody is Amazon, and you can go uh, under my name, James Emery White, and you can find Hybrid Church and other books related to the practice of ministry and culture, books written for non-Christians that you can use, and Rise of the Nuns and Meet Generation Z and any number of cultural issues that might serve, but uh, Amazon under James Emery White. And then in terms of uh, most of the other stuff, go to churchandculture.org, churchandculture.org, and that's where you can subscribe to, I mean, you can get the free podcast, free blogs, and lots of free resources daily, headline news related to church and culture. It's just really designed to be a resource for for uh, pastors and church leaders. Thank you. Listeners, I know some of the topics discussed today may be a little challenging for some, but if we want to be kingdom-minded and reach people, certainly some things we need to think about. Pastor White, what a pleasure to spend the last few moments with you and imparting some truth and challenging listeners today. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Grant. This is Dr. Lambert with the Center for Thriving Leaders and Grace Theological Seminary, challenging you to keep thriving in ministry. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This is Dr. Trent Lambert with the Center for Thriving Leaders and Grace Theological Seminary, challenging you to keep thriving in ministry. Thanks for joining us today.